we are good. AT, take it away. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully, everybody had some good uh, conversation there. And, you know, obviously, we, you know, we loved having these face-to-face uh, pre-COVID, but hopefully this is still at least a little bit of good networking for you uh, as we're virtual here. So again, I want to thank Anju Matthew, CEO and founder of Oncolens. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, we're excited to, to share more about your story. So, you know, what we'll cover here is probably three areas. We'll start with just a little bit of Anju's background uh, and how she got into healthcare and startups, then move into the Oncolens story of how it came about and some of the things that they've done uh, along the way and the successes and challenges and lessons learned. And then we'll wrap up with just some broader thoughts on Atlanta and healthcare and entrepreneurship. Um, so with that, Anju, you know, go ahead and just, just, just jump in. You know, how did you decide to even get involved in healthcare as you were, you know, coming out of school and, and starting your journey? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so interestingly, you know, I was always interested in healthcare, and I would say the more of the science behind healthcare, right, and uh, disease treatment and things like that. So just growing up. Um, so, you know, it obviously we come to a point of time when we need to choose a career, and I had enough exposure to the healthcare side of things to see how things actually work. And I have to say, I was, while I love the science, scientific aspect of it, just watching people and doing their regular lives, it didn't really the one part that was truly missing to me was that there was very little opportunity as far as I could see as a kid growing up for creativity, right? And the ability to change things and build something that goes beyond your years and your lifetime to a certain extent. So um, with that, and then, you know, I loved it. So I, I love the creative aspect of being an engineer and what I saw there, but I was confused there too. And I was like, well, engineer in what? Right. <laughs> you know, so it was just like this thing. But so eventually, anyway, I did go in for an engineering degree. And afterwards, with that, uh, still with that confusion in mind, I came out and started being, I was a product engineer, a software engineer. So my first job was actually with IBM um, and dating myself. And basically, I was maintaining, well, just supporting the OS2 platform, the old operating system. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I realized, no, this is not what I wanted to do being a software engineer uh, for a long time. So I went to business school and, you know, got exposure to various industries. And I always found that um, I was gravitated, gravitating towards healthcare, right? So I like doing healthcare projects. I went into management consulting first with AT Kearney, um, but, you know, always loved to do work on those projects and just understanding. And really it was what tied back to my heart right, is like, I felt like, okay, this is something that can make a difference, right? So, you know, fast forward a few years, I was in management consulting, and it just happened that, um, you know, we decided to move, we were in Minnesota at that time, and then decided to move to Atlanta. And um, I thought I would take a break, and come and find, I would find another, you know, a nice job. And the day we landed in Atlanta after a break, a three month break was when Lehman Brothers went down. So this is in 2008. So with that, you know, my whole job search strategy changed, but as, you know, opportunity comes out of, um, you know, sometimes what looks like disaster, uh, I met two scientists actually. So um, they're actually prolific entrepreneurs in the, in the healthcare space uh, here in Atlanta. And we co-founded, so with my background in business, we co-founded a medical device in the cancer imaging space, they had access to this technology called polarization subtraction. So that was my first foray into healthcare and entrepreneurship, and I loved it. And um, so with that experience, I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I wanted it to be in healthcare um, and did that for three years. We built the medical device. We weren't able to take it through clinical trials. We sold the technology. Um, but then, so I very much knew at that point, I'm going to be in healthcare. I need to learn more. And so that's when I decided to go to McKesson. Um, and with my strategy background, I joined their corporate strategy and M&A group. So again, that gave me exposure to a lot of different parts of McKesson and the various businesses. And then from there, um, I was invited to join McKesson's medical surgical business unit and lead their technology innovation and partnerships. So first starting with what they call primary uh, care, which is actually physician practices on the distribution side. And then afterwards I had um, health, um, health IDNs as well as post-acute care. 
uh, all under me. So that again gave me the opportunity in a very McKesson Med Surge, in fact, had just gone through a, a merger with the second largest player in the country. And so it is a very, very entrepreneurial environment. Um, and uh, frankly, I loved it, but it also gave me the ability to learn multiple aspects of growing a business um, because it gave me exposure to working, working very closely with the sales team. I didn't, they didn't report directly to me, but it was very much that we were launching new products, new solutions. And so it was a very combined team, team effort, building those solutions, marketing those solutions, getting it out into yeah. market and then customer success. So owning that entire process just positioned me very well um, for being an entrepreneur as well, even though I was within a very large corporation. Yeah, no, in, in, interesting there, Andy. So a couple of questions on, on that, right, that you said, I want to talk about the diverse background in, in a second, but you mentioned, hey, when you first tried it, entrepreneurship with combined healthcare and the medevice, you said, I loved it. Sort of yeah. why? What was it about it that sort of, you know, got you excited uh, and, and fascinated with that space? Yeah, so I think it's really, you know, what pulls at your heart, right? You feel like you're doing something that makes a difference number one. Um, and it was, again, you're, you're being a pioneer in an area. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur sometimes, especially if it's something new and innovative. You are pioneering a new path, a new path forward, right? It's changing the way things are being done. And that's what I love about humans and humanity, humanity in general. I think we have ultimately, sometimes it goes bad, but most, there's a lot of good in what we do and we bring innovation to, to the space. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think it, you know, it's, it's a very subtle thing. It's hard to describe, but it's really that, that feeling that you're making a difference. Yeah, very, very cool. So let me ask this question, because one of the questions I, I get from entrepreneurs a lot is, when should I start my business? Like, should I do it like right out of school? Should I go work for a little bit? Should I get some of these experiences? And obviously you know, you've now had, you know, been involved in multiple startups, but also had the benefit of, you know, the IBM software engineering background, the consulting background, the innovation corporate background. Yeah. Tell me more about how those have helped you uh, in your current uh, startup by having those, those backgrounds. I think it's helped me immensely. Um, and to, since we're, you know, talking more about healthcare here, I think having a core understanding of how healthcare works and the different players within healthcare is really very critical to, to being, you know, I would say to lowering your risk for, you know, for failure, right? Um, it, you can still work through it. You can still learn. You can be a fast learner, but just having that, uh, I would say a few things, right? So almost an embedded network that can help you move faster, right? And in healthcare, things take time. You have to, it is a longer sales cycle. Um, there are many, many players and stakeholders in any sort of purchase, if you will, like if you're selling to a hospital or a payer. So understanding those nuances, I think is very important. Um, but then things that apply also across any type of business, right? How do you manage a sales team? How do you bring customer success, product development, sales all together and kind of running at the same time? Those are elements that even if you don't necessarily directly manage those um, in your prior like career, at least observing and see how that's been done, I think just gives you a little bit of a leg up, right? Versus getting jumping straight into healthcare. I think I've, I've seen several people who jump straight straight out of school and try to start something in healthcare. You learn a lot, but I think you could there's a lot of risk there as well. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think obviously you know, one of the things that I think makes healthcare different than other industries is you, know, you could go start a B2B software company and put a web page up tonight and get 10 customers. Yeah. Uh, but healthcare doesn't work that way. And to your point, <laughs> you've got to be able to navigate all the different stakeholders because there's always many involved and, and some of how it works and the relationships because they are longer mm -hmm. sales cycles, et cetera. So I think that that experience makes a lot of sense that you were able to understand and that probably better positioned you to navigate uh, mm -hmm. those things because of your experience. Yeah. Well, great. Well, maybe let's transition that a little bit to, you know, what you're working on now with, with Oncolens. So maybe to start for everybody who doesn't know, you know, what's the elevator pitch on Oncolens and then we'll go into like how you even started on, on that idea. Yeah, so Oncolens, uh, we are a digital SaaS-based platform for cancer centers and cancer providers. And what we facilitate is that multidisciplinary care treatment planning. 
Um, so for those who are familiar with cancer care, you know, it is a very multidisciplinary specialty, meaning it does require the involvement of several core specialists like medonks, radonks. Um, oh, you can still see me, right, AT? Just yes. make sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have flaky uh, internet connection here. Uh, medonks, radonks, radiologists, pathologists, and, you know, ancillary providers. And all of them truly need to come together to make the right treatment plan for a, for a patient. However, what we struggle with is your data as a patient might be in different silos. You have a primary care practitioner and then you have medonks separate, surgery separate. That needs to come together. The team needs to come together. And cancer now is in a space where the data is changing so rapidly. Um, just four years ago, in fact, we were with, uh, talking to one of the uh, genomic providers, uh, testing providers yesterday. The mutational level data was basically, it was, they had 4 million records in their database four years ago. Right now it's 73 million records, data records. So that's how fast the data is moving and treatments are very base specific to your genotype, the tumor genotype or your genetic makeup, right? And it's very hard for providers, especially in the community to stay on top of those uh, decisions and treatment uh, options. So what we do is we bring all that together for the care treatment uh, team. So aggregating the patient data along with the right team for the, that patient, along with clinical decision support. So what are some of the right treatment methodologies, the latest treatment methodologies, evidence-based guidelines, clinical trial matches that are applicable to that patient so they can build out to that, the, the right treatment plan. Very cool. Thanks for that overview. Uh, and lots of cool things we'll dive into here on, on that in a minute. But so then back to you, hey, you were working at McKesson, you, you're, you're doing some great things there, got some exposure to innovation and the other corporate functions. How, tell me more about how this idea came out and how did you decide, hey, I want to go pursue this idea? Yeah, great question. So a couple of things, um, you know, while I was actually at McKesson, um, so my father and slightly before that, he, uh, my father was diagnosed with leukemia. And when he was diagnosed, he, he was pretty much given two weeks um, and said, you know, yeah, you, unless you go into some sort of treatment right now, you have two weeks to live. We met with three different physicians at the same institution and each physician gave a different recommendation. One was, it's really a hard process forward. I would just wrap it up, don't do anything. Um, the other one was go aggressive chemotherapy and the third one was a bone marrow transplant. And he, you know, with him being the patient and he, he had two weeks to live, I saw basically that he had, he had to make that decision on his own. Coming from other industries, you know, when you're giving such a strong recommendation, um, or even like if it's a just a hundred thousand budget spend, you talk to somebody else about it, right? There's a somewhat of a team-based approach that does not happen in healthcare. So I definitely, you know, walked away from that experience thinking, well, that was, you know, how do I really wish they had come to us saying, well, we discussed this as a team, and this is what we feel is, you know, the best recommendation for you. But no, instead he was left to go make that decision on his own. And that's why you see a lot of patients will go for a second opinion. They'll try and manage that process on their own. So definitely some breakdowns there that we observed. Um, and then flash forward a few years forward, we were talking about this. I was having this discussion with my co-founder, um, Lee Joe, who is a practicing hematologist, oncologist, and um, actually one of the directors of the, one of the Emory sites. And we were talking about this multidisciplinary treatment process, right? That planning process. And it was just, it was amazing to hear how hard it was, right? To get the data together in a timely manner because cancer patients, you have to get that plan pretty much within two weeks of diagnosis, right? But get all that data together at the right time, get all the specialists together at the right time with the relevant information and then highlight some of the, you know, what are the, what are the relevant treatments and making sure that they're up to date on that. That's a really hard process, right? And they were spending, just to get the data together, they, they had resources, full-time resources. For four meetings, they had two um, like that to discuss on average five patients per meeting. They had two full-time resources just to pull the data. Mm -hmm. So at that point it was, well, okay, well, let's see if we can, we can improve on this process. You know, and they were called, they're called tumor boards. They've been around for 30, 40 years. 
they had gone down to the point where, you know, they just ended up being meetings where providers could come in, meet each other, have lunch, breakfast or something like that. But it wasn't truly that there was a lot of opportunity for improvement. So that's where we started. And, uh, you know, I was like, well, this is healthcare. So I'm not, I, I'm going to start with a prototype and MVP and let's see how it goes. Um, so we, we put that in place at Emory DeCab after a lot of discussions internally with how the process works. Um, but then saw some amazing results from there. So within the first year, we saw a 90% reduction in the needed time and resources going into that planning process. Um, so from there, you know, with that initial success, um, actually other hospitals started to ask for it. And then I wanted to test the market a little bit further. You know, just not going into it, just saying, okay, well, it worked at one place or two places. Let's see, you know, let's see if there's truly a need. So went to several conferences. Um, so like the, the Cancer Registrar Association, these are the group that manage a lot of these, the data collection went to a few other conferences, talked to people about it and said, okay, tell us a little bit about your process, your workflow. And from there trying to assess, okay, where is there a need? And the, the one thing I always, especially in my prior days with innovation, I don't start with a solution and ask them, okay, will this help you? I start with what's your true pain point, right? Because if you ask, if you say, if you've put the solution in front of them, they'll say, yeah, yeah, I'll try it. But when it comes down to brass tactics, they're they're not, they probably will not try it. You have to really understand whether they have a pain there. I think that's a, gr a great point. I want to pause and highlight. I mean, that rings so true to me, right? Is that too often I see people go pitch their solution. I do X, Y, Z, I save all. And to your point, you're going to get a lot of people will say, that's nice, or yeah, I tried, or yeah, I'd use it, but they're just being nice. They're not yeah. really going to gonna do it. And you're fooling yourself versus I loved how you said, Hey, I already had something, but I still went and asked, tell me about your workflow. How are you doing it? Um, I, I love I love that line of questioning. So big takeaway for anybody in the audience there, start with the problem, uh, not the <laughs> solution, solution. So Anya, let me follow up on a couple of things there you said, which are interesting. You know, First was just Emory DeCab, right? Obviously getting your first paying customer, your first customer is hard in any industry, but let alone in healthcare. Yeah. What were some tips or tricks you learned of how to build that relationship and get somebody willing enough to try it to get you those great results uh, that you could then use to, to talk to the next uh, system? Yeah, no, that is a great question. And I have to say it was because Lijo was, you know, had that relationship into Emory de Cab, right? And so, and we were, and he was close with the director there. Um, and same thing. So they were our first beta site and our second beta site was Southern Regional Down South. Um, I think it is important. Uh, I mean, either it's through it through some channel of yours internally. It may be through if you're part of an incubator like um, ATDC and it was trying to uh, connect different companies with other institutions that may pilot something. Um, but I think it's always helpful if there's somebody in your team or you yourself have a connection into a hospital. You may do it through an advisor. You may do it through an investor, right? but finding those in one way or the other, a connection. And I, I do believe that connection should be strong because especially when you are piloting something, there's always going to be issues, right? You're gonna to have to fix things. And that person has to basically work with the other stakeholders and calm them down and say, no, we're fixing this. We're going to be working through this. So they have to support you on the customer side, right? I think one of the biggest dangers is you launch, you launch your MVP it doesn't work the way the customer wants it to work. It's not perfect. And we all know that we can't make it perfect. And then they may say, no, that's it, we're done, right? You get one or two chances to try. So the person who's supporting you internally on the customer side has to be able to really push that forward and believe in what you're doing. Hey, that's, that's another great point I wanna pause on is that the product is never perfect, especially at the beginning, right? And having the expectation that your pilot delivers the perfect anything is going to not set you up for success. But more importantly, like you said, having a partner who believes in the vision of what you're doing and is willing to work with you to make it solve that uh, is so powerful. And it's just a different frame of mind that I think that allows you much higher chance of success mm -hmm. of figuring out you know, what it is to solve that problem. Yeah. And I, I just like to add to that too. I think, you know, I'm sure there are entrepreneurs in this group as well. And, you know, if you're thinking of starting something and you are not fundamentally, uh, you know, working with a provider, let's say you're targeting a provider, 
um, as your customer base. I think it's very important to have somebody in your team who, who is. And I think it helps longer term in terms of just opening it up, opening up even discussions from a peer to peer level. The fact that Lijo is my co-founder, he's a physician, a practicing physician, it just helps open the doors immensely, especially during the early days when you need that early traction and you can have a peer to peer discussion then with another physician, right? Another provider group, That's, that just helps tremendously. I, I would echo that from my personal page, trying to sell products uh, without a you know, chief medical officer or physician in the room, I, you know, one yeah. of the common things I would get was, well, when have you practiced medicine? You know, and, yeah. and, and, and questions like that. And just having that person in the room or can talk in the language uh, makes a big deal, even if they're an advisor or somebody that you bring in uh, mm -hmm. as needed. Yeah. Well, let me just, uh, just quick you know, time check. We'll probably go another, you know, five, 10 minutes here and then switch over to Q&A. So folks, if you have Q&A, feel free to put them in the chat and JC will consolidate them uh, and ask at the end. But Anju, let me go then from, hey, you, you got the first one, you got a second one, and now you're talking to folks and hearing the problem consistently. You know, people talk about product market fit all the time, and it's an ever-evolving thing, but when did you start to know, or what were the signs that led you to believe, hey, I'm really on to something here, and this can scale beyond just this one hospital? Yeah, so... Um... It was after, so we, we had several discussions after the, we did the beta and we were still having those discussions on an ongoing basis. And um, I would say, you know, as we started to talk to folks and started to see, okay, yes, we do have a significant pain point here. Um, we, you know, I can't pinpoint a specific number, but as we, I would point it out to almost like, okay, if you meet, like you're meeting, you know, five to six different people and you have, uh, I would say on average, two people outlining, yes, this is, this is a problem I'm very familiar with. Obviously it has to be that right target market, right? But there's, you know, approximately 40 to 50% of the people saying, yes, this is a, this is a problem that we deal with every day. Um, I think that, that gave me a sense of after talking to them and doing that market research and customer discovery that, yeah, there is, there is a market for this. Now, I will still say where we tripped up, though, was in the pricing, <laughs> right? So, yeah, there's a market for it, but at what price, right? And so that is, I won't say we solved that right off the bat. In fact, probably one of the things that took me some time to figure out is we went out with a different price point, but then this is the complexity of healthcare. It really depends on where your budget is coming from, right? Um, again, it may not apply so much to payers. Frankly, I don't know much about the payer world, but on the provider side, where your budget is ultimately coming from matters a lot. And initially the way we positioned the product was to the cancer registry, which has a lower budget, right? Point, and they have restrictions on their budget. So pricing became an issue later on that pain point is very valid the, what we are trying to uh, solve for sure so then as you're starting to hear hey we've, we've got some success stories we've got others that are sharing this same problem you know another common question we get from entrepreneurs is hey should we raise money or not to grow and try and tackle this and obviously you've been very successful in terms of raising close to 12 million dollars you know especially from some local folks here as well Tell, tell us about your thought process there and sort of any lessons learned on, on deciding to raise money and, and, and go after this problem. Yeah, um, again, very good question. I think it's also a personal or the decisions of, you know, and you, whoever the founders of the company are, right? So um, initially I would say, so the way Lidra and I approached this is we wanted to bootstrap the company and we were in a position to bootstrap the company to a point where, we had enough market traction. We already were, you know, we were revenue positive because we didn't want to take on that much dilution up front, right? Um, so we did that. And um, I will say though, the, the fact that expedited the need for funding was, the, was we could see very much in front of our eyes that the market was also moving forward. 
competitors were coming in. When we started and launched mid-2017, there was nobody else. But very soon after that, we had actually Roche, which is a pharma company, come in with something similar. Now, the good news is we've been able to beat them very well since then, but we knew that there was more competition coming into the market. People as, at conferences, when we were presenting, people were looking at us and you could see even other, other players in the market were like, okay, that's a neat thing. You know, why don't we do some, try and do something like that? So we knew we had to move fast. We had to respond fast in terms of innovation and, you know, continuously add to the product and expand what the product can do, uh, but also move fast to grab land. I think in healthcare, um, well, it depends. I wouldn't say it's in all scenarios, but in our in our specific scenario, how much land you actually grab early on is very important. So that drove us to say, okay, well, no, we need to, uh, let's not, uh, you know, for the success of the company, we have to move faster. We need to get in more um, resources into the company. So for that, you need investment. Very, very cool. Well, let me Wrap up with sort of two two questions here, and then we'll open it up to Q and A. So again, I see some questions coming in the chat. Feel free to to message JC or others. But you know, as you're you're starting to go, you know, through through this, what are a couple of just you know broader things you've learned of? Hey, what can Atlanta do to better support healthcare entrepreneurs uh, in driving innovation here out of Atlanta? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I think, you know, when I, uh, I think we're overcoming that a little bit. I think um, in the earlier days, well, this is back in 20, not, it's not too many years ago, but there's already a significant amount of change. So it's 2018, 2019. Um, there weren't too many investors, frankly. Now we start to see their successful founders who are starting smaller, you know, uh, uh, smaller funds. So bringing some more competition into the market, I think that's great, but it's not only competition from a, in, um, from a funding standpoint, but it's also just knowledge base and know-how of exactly how healthcare works, right? And that was, that's a big difference. That makes a big difference having an investor who is a financial investor versus investor who really knows the market, right? And can really propel you to the next level. You know, it's, and it's making those connections to making Hiring becomes one of the biggest decisions you have to make once you start growing the team and finding the right people for you. I think those are very, very valuable um, aspects. So I think having a growing investor team within Atlanta is very important. Um, can I say, you know, I hear this a lot. I, I, I don't think it's an impediment whether, you know, the local hospitals, providers, um, healthcare companies, can uh, can be more collaborative around with smaller companies to run pilots and prototypes. I think there's absolutely the opportunity to do so. But if you know if you're an entrepreneur, we'll find a solution somewhere else. You know, so I think after we worked with Emory and uh, Southern Regional, it was hard to get into some of the bigger institutions, and they have their own red tape. You know, it's um, and it's hard to work through. So we went we went outside and. Um, our next one was actually in Connecticut, um, our, next, uh, other, our next customer. So we just, we just went outside. I don't think those things should stop you as an entrepreneur. Great. Well, last question, Anju, and then I'll open it up you know, to the audience for some Q&A. You know, obviously, you've, you've had a ton of great experiences you know, across the healthcare space and then you know, in the startup world and what you're building with OncoLens. Any other lessons learned or advice to founders here uh, that we haven't touched on that you would sort of wrap up with? Um, that's a good question. You know, I think for me, you know, um, as you're growing your team, so there's various phases in which your company will go through it. I'm looking forward to the, the future and the challenges that you go through. But when I look back, you know, there's a point of time when you're figuring out very early on product market fit then you have to start scaling um, and you're starting to build up from there. I think across the board, um, the one thing that becomes very important is your team and always keeping, I think it's always, you know, we tend to say, well, let me get to this next point and then I'm going to hire the next person. I'm going to hire the next person. I think for me, what has, where I lost a little bit of traction early on was saying, okay, well, I have some more time before I hire the, the nice person. If you find a really good person, you have to start thinking the, a little bit more one or two steps ahead. 
your team is ultimately going to be what is going to make you successful. Um, and so getting those people, you find them very, they're strong, they're strong candidates, they can help propel you to the next level, you know, get them in or try and grab them as soon as possible. I think that really, yeah, it's building out, you, you know, once, once you come to the phase of building out an organization, it's who you hire then that becomes the most, some of the most important decisions. Yeah, that's great. I love love ending with that. You know, one of the things I always love that you know David Cummings says is you know the, the team and the culture is the one thing it's a hundred percent in your control as an entrepreneur uh, that makes such a big difference. There are so many other things that you can't control what competitors do or how the sales process completely works and and everything like that. Uh, but you can hundred percent control your team and your culture and spending the time on that uh, and hearing that from you, Andrew, of how important that is. Uh, I love that. Well, great. Well, let me open it up to questions. I know some were coming in via the, the chat. Uh, JC, if you want to yeah. hop on, maybe ask a few of those. And I have some others as well, but let's, let's start with what's in the chat or come to you first. Yes. So John Jonathan had asked, how difficult has it been to navigate the different regulatory and security requirements of different sites? So, you know, SOC2, high trust, internal policies, et cetera. Can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, great question. So yes, that is, uh, it is, uh, it takes a lot of time. That is the most significant part of our sales cycle. Um, so especially in our solution, we get um, approval from the clinical and the business team or the administrative team within a hospital within, uh, you know, two months or two to three months. And the remaining, sometimes nine, <laughs> up to nine months is the legal and the IT review process. Now, in our case, what we did is we did simplify a few things up front, and I think that was some important product-based decisions we made. Number one is, okay, how much time does it take from the IT resource of the hospital? Reduce that as much as possible, right? So if, because a big part of how much time and effort you will get or support from the IT hospital team is based on how much resources they need to put in. So in our scenario, in fact, if there's, um, we, we have the ability to actually start up on a standalone version without being integrated into the EMR. It's not perfect, but still a lot of uh, value derived from it. So we enable that. So that requires pretty much no IT resources from the hospital side. So that reduces the complexity. It moves a little bit faster. Um, secondly, I would say, you know, from, a, from the standpoint also of a solution, like, so let's talk regulatory. We provide, um, we, do, we stop short of telling the physicians, okay, this is our recommendation and how you should treat this patient. Because when you do that, then you need to go in for a 501k at the, at the very least. We give them, this is the relevant information that can help you make the best decision for this patient. And that's where we stop. So we don't have to cross that, that barrier. Then the third one is again, high trust and all those certifications. Um, absolutely, so when, now those are expensive. So when we started out, we had third party audits on our platform. Um, we did our internal audits. We had all the documentation ready for our hospitals. Once they saw that we were organized, we had this and we had a roadmap to a high trust or SOC 2 certification. They were actually, it was very interesting. We didn't come across much pushback and it always helps, again, if as part of the customer, and this is our biggest learning, I think, when selling into providers, you must have a business or a clinical supporter or sponsor. And if that's a strong sponsor, frankly, they can push through a lot of these barriers. Yeah, that's great advice. Hopefully uh, we can use some of that or some of those folks can use it. Um, here's, a, here's another question. Um, what order of functions did you hire as you grew? I know you just were speaking about that. Can you give a little insight onto kind of the process? Yeah, yeah, no, great question. It's one I always uh, think about too. Uh, it's like, why did I do that? But anyways, uh, so when I started, um, obviously, so I had an IT team. Now this was interesting, it was, uh, they were an outsourced IT team. In retrospect, I would not do that again. Um, it is very hard to control, especially in your prototype, um, the, uh, uh, an outsource IT team. The timing is different. It wastes a lot of your time. Um, and especially when you are in, the, in that framework of building something new and you have to sometimes scratch things and start first. Mm -hmm. Having somebody, a local partner, um, it doesn't have to be a CTO necessarily. You do, I don't mm -hmm. think you need that if you are just testing out a, an idea or a prototype, but having somebody local to work through, work with is, is good. And sometimes the quality you get is much better. 
So, um, but that was how I started. I started with an outsourced IT team. And then the next role that I brought in was actually because we started sooner than I even thought we started bringing on customers. So I needed a customer engagement or success manager. And she actually had a background as a cancer registrar. So it helped from that uh, SME perspective too. The second one that I was really targeting at that point was because I had that IT outsource team still was a sales lead, but it was very hard for me to find the right person, again, going down to the right culture and understanding. So we, we kept, uh, I kept trying at that, but then simultaneously, then I knew I needed to bring in an IT lead. And so he was, he was our next, our head of uh, uh, development was the next hire. Uh, for me, and he was, you know, again, a true partner that helped, um, that helped, uh, you know, build, build the company. So in summary, it was outsourced IT development team, then customer success, um, one and then two people, head of development, I was still, but I wanted to bring in the salesperson earlier, because the sales cycle is longer in healthcare. So frankly, it buys you some time on product development. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. I think just for, for time's sake, maybe AT will, um, if there's no more questions, wrap it up. Yeah. The thanks again, Anju. Really appreciate you taking the time. Such great lessons learned there. I got really, you know, starting with the problem and then the importance of building the team and culture and having that physician as an advisor or on staff to have some of those. I love some of those uh, lessons learned there. So appreciate you taking the time. Uh, just You're as, most as welcome next steps you know to, to wrap up uh again you know, we'll have another uh land of startup combos with other early stage entrepreneurs coming up here the end of april uh, as well as early may we'll have another healthcare meetup uh still working with a couple of folks on on who will be a part of that but probably early may and then just last thing i want to point out is just for those who are uh new to this we have a page on our website uh, around healthcare just just to highlight it's got recordings of our past meetups. It's got events from local area organizations and, and such. And we also keep a, a running list of the Atlanta healthcare IT companies. They're doing some amazing things here. So we've got plenty on here. I'm sure there's more we're missing. So if yours isn't on here, or if you have others that you know uh, that should be on here, there's just a form on the webpage to fill out uh, and we'll gladly post them up uh, and get them out there. So it's a great way for me to send to folks who are interested in investing in Atlanta health IT companies or being involved in them. Uh, to see what's out there. So, but with that, I know it's uh, coming up on nine o'clock. Again, thank you, Anju. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, and you all have a great day. Thank you. Take care. All right, take thank care. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you. Thanks, y'all.